There's no way I can pick it up from where I am. This is so frustrating. Hello and welcome to the 12th episode of the Sittin' and Knitting Podcast. I am your hostess, Diana. Today is Wednesday, February 6, 2012, and I am podcasting from Southwest Ohio. I would like to, first of all, thank returning viewers for coming back and taking time out of your day to spend time with me. And I also would like to thank the new viewers who are just turning tuning in for the first time for trying me out. And um, I hope that uh, you'll come back. So um, we're going to get started. And the title of this podcast is Lazy Podcaster because I am going to forego my previous format, at least for today, and not uh, cut the segments up in too many, but um, it takes a little more time with editing, and it just takes a little bit more time, and I don't have a lot of time right now, so I thought I would just mostly concentrate on sitting and talking with you instead of trying to um, make the segments just so. Um, So we'll see how this works. Uh, It took me a little while to get started, so now I'm trying to calm down because, you know, when I get ready to podcast, it's like sewing. I have my sewing table all set up, and I have my sewing machine there, so when I get some time to sew, I can sit down and sew. But if any length of time goes away and everything gets packed away, I never want to start sewing again because I've got to unpack my machine, I've got to find my threads, scissors, and all of that, and And so it just takes me a lot of time instead of when I have a little bit of time, just like with our knitting time, it takes more time to gather the materials than it actually does. It takes away from the time that we have to do our work. So um, I was all ready to podcast and start podcasting a half hour ago, and then I couldn't find this, and I couldn't find that, and I had to look look up this, and so different things like that. So here I am. I guess I should tell you uh, where you can find me. You can find me as His Handmaid on Ravelry, on Plurk, I'm there occasionally, on Twitter, and also on Instagram. Um, I have been a little less visible on the social media sites only because, again, my time is limited, and I enjoy those sites very, very much. I enjoy the social part of it, but it takes away from my knitting time, knitting time and I can't do both. So. Um, but I am there occasionally. I really like Instagram because you can go on real quick and, and see just people's pictures and a little, you know, two, one or two sentences. And, and that's kind of fun too. So that's what I've been doing right now. Um, the girls, I'm not sure if they will be joining me this afternoon or not. They are currently at the dentist, but they do have only a limited time to get their sweater, their projects done for the school um, convention that's coming up in the middle of March. So I think they want to come on and talk to you about that. So we may see them later. I'm not sure. So let's get started. The first thing that we'll talk about is Out of My Hands. And Out of My Hands is the Somiar Pullover uh, by Juliana Lunder, who's Jules Lunder on Ravelry. Um, This is a downloadable pattern. I test knitted for her. She was test knitting, I mean, she was um, submitting the pattern to the Knit Picks Independent Designer Program, but it is now for, uh, it is now released and you can purchase it on Ravelry. I believe the price is $6. Um, So I am wearing this now and I have a lot to say about it. Let me well, let me tell you about it first. I knit it out of Knit Picks Wolta, and I believe um, the color was oh, Blue Midnight or something like that. Um, I have it on my project page, 
on Ravelry. But anyway, it the color was discontinued, which caused me a little alarm. But I was able to get through it. I, I'm not sure if I talked to you last week about not knowing if I, I did talk to you last week about searching and finding, uh, looking for some more yarn. And I did end up finding one ball, but I I messaged that Ravelry, Raveler back and told her she didn't have to send it because I thought I could finish with what I had. And I did, so that was fine. Um, I used USI 7 uh, needles. I'm not sure the millimeters on that. And um, I started this around December 27th and uh, finished it around January 27th. So it took me about a month. It was a lot of fun to knit in a lot of ways because I love knitting in the round. I used to knit a, a lot of sweaters in the round for my children when I first started knitting eight years ago, and I haven't done it in a while. I usually knit cardigans because I'm not a pullover person, and I forgot how fun it is to knit in the round. And so I really enjoyed that. Uh, just a second. Okay. The phone was ringing, so I wanted to go catch that. Um, so, like I said, I really enjoyed knitting in the round. First, let me tell you the sweater, and then I'll teach, or show you the sweater, and then I'll tell you more about it. So here it is, finished. Um, I don't know if it's focusing real well or not. Let me turn off this light. It is a V-neck sweater. Um, this is it in the back. This is it from the side. Um, let's see what what else can I tell you about it. It has what she calls a dash pattern, which I think is called a caterpillar pattern, maybe in other knitting books. This is the collar. Now we can talk about the sweater and what happened with the sweater. I'm going to go ahead here now and insert pictures of what the sweater looked like before it was blocked. I hope I can insert these pictures. I hope my beautiful editor journey can get that done for me. So hold on just a second. Okay, now what happened with the sweater? That was the before pictures, and as you can see, the fit is really different. The sweater grew tremendously with blocking, and I'm very disappointed because I really like the fit before I blocked it. It fit perfectly. My husband loved the fit, and I was just so happy and so proud. Uh, this is my first adult sweater. Um, yes, I, I believe it's my first adult sweater that I've done. Uh, so what happened was I got gauge. Um, I don't have my gauge swatch anymore. Actually, my gauge swatch is my sleeve. I got gauge knitting in the round, and I started with my sleeve. Like like Easy said, I kind of used my sleeve as a gauge swatch, and I got the gauge knitting in the round. I did not block my gauge swatch, and I think that was my first mistake. So, second mistake was my, um, in the round knitting is tighter than my flat knitting. So, when you get to, let me see if I can show you, when you get to right here where you're starting to do the V-neck, you start working back and forth. After you connect the sleeves, because it's knit from the bottom up, and after you connect the sleeves, to the body, then you start knitting back and forth. Well, my back and forth gauge is a, is looser than my in the round gauge, second mistake. Um, thirdly, when I'm knitting in a tight circumference, I believe my gauge then is tighter than I'm, when I'm knitting on a bigger circumference, for example, my sleeve. Um, so this is what I would do different. I think also last week I talked to you all about the fact that after I had got through the four inches of two by two ribbing on 190 something stitches, 
I realized that I had not done the ribbing two sizes and with a needle two sizes smaller like the pattern calls for. I really don't like really tight pulled in ribbing when the ribbing is real tight and then the sweater is a little looser and it kind of gives it a muffin look. So I thought I would be okay with that. And so I said, well, if it doesn't work out, I can rip back the ribbing. I really want to get the test knitting done. And I could rip back the ribbing and um, do it again. So I don't know if you noticed the ribbing. It's looser here. And I really don't, don't like that. But I think maybe if I had not, if, if it had been, if the blocking had been different, then maybe it wouldn't be so bad. So the things that I learned from this is to wash and dry my gauge swatch. And also, and I think I've known this from knitting children's sweaters, that since I knit in the round on a smaller circumference, tighter than I do, like there was 200 plus stitches on the body, but not nearly that much, less than 100 on the sleeves. So when I do the sleeves on future sweaters, I will probably go up a needle size. Uh, from whatever my gauge is, I will go up a needle size because I personally don't like tight sleeves. So just for a little um, more, just for not such a dense fabric on my sleeves, I will go up a, um, a needle size. I will make sure I'm doing the right needle size for the ribbing, and I will also swatch flat. Now, I did not read through the pattern before I started it. I just started going, going, going. So I didn't realize. It's been a while since I've done. I've only done one other V-neck sweater, and it was a cardigan. Um, I didn't realize that I was going to be working back and forth. How I thought. I just didn't think it through. through. Of course, I couldn't go in the round when there's this big space here. So I should have uh, swatched flat. So I will do that. So um, I've learned, like I said, about the ribbing, about washing and drying my gauge swatch, and about swatching round and flat depending on what the pattern says. Um, and yeah, uh, the collar is a little shallower. This was the last thing that I did. And it's a little shallower than what it looks like on her project page or, you know, the, uh, the pattern looks like. I tried to block it, and it seems like the only thing that grew were the ends. The middle really didn't grow in the blocking. So I really do not like the sweater now. I don't like how it fits me because it keeps falling down off of my shoulders. Um, and the V is way too low. Let me show you. I didn't realize that the V, and even before I blocked it, the V is a little lower than I thought. But then I thought it's kind of like having a cardigan buttoned up because I have a, one of my favorite cardigans I button up to about right here. So it's kind of like having a cardigan that's buttoned up without the button. So I, I guess I really don't like that so much, but I didn't realize the V was going to be so low. I think on her pattern, it looked um, a little, the pattern, it looked like it was a little higher. And also the collar is, is not as deep as her pattern. And since I keep talking about her pattern, I'm going to go ahead and show you a picture of the pattern right here from Ravon. Okay, here's a picture of the sweater. And I'm sorry, you see a glare. Um, she has better pictures on her final uh, pattern. I just received the final pattern from her yesterday. And so she has better pictures. I guess the, the collar doesn't look too big there. I knit the size that she's wearing. Um, and as far as the V, it looks like the V hit her a little higher than what it hit me. So um, I'm not sure what I did there, maybe I should have, I don't know. If I had knit more, 
If I had knit more inches on the body, I like the way it fits. I don't know why the V is lower for me than it is on their pattern. I do want to say that I did enjoy the pattern and that I do plan on knitting it again. And I plan on knitting it again soon. And now that all the kinks are worked out and everything else, I know I said before, you know, it was difficult testing the pattern. But I really like the sweater and I, I like how it fits. And I really enjoyed knitting it. And my husband really likes it too. So I'm I'm planning on knitting it again again as soon as I get the yarn. I really didn't think that I wanted to knit too many worsted weight sweaters. But um, this one is really not too bad. I It's not as bulky looking as I thought it would be. And so it's an enjoyable knit. I believe I it took me, she asked about how long it took to knit it. I would say maybe 40 hours, but I did more unknitting than I did knitting. And I don't know if I've talked to you about this before, but there would be times that I would knit, 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 and realize that I'm supposed to be doing a pattern round instead of a plain round. And so I would have to unknit maybe a whole round or something. And I did that numerous times, enough to have probably knit this sweater a time and a half because things are going on around me and I'm just knitting, knitting, knitting. It seems like the only thing that I can really, because I've run into that with other patterns I'm working on, that I can really knit on, if I'm not by myself, is something that's stockinette stitch, which is, kind of disappointing you know I like to do pattern stitches and different things like that but even though I feel like I'm a multitasker as a mom I I just can't concentrate for instance I cannot um, listen to something in the background while I'm reading I can't uh, while I'm on Ravelry I can't have something music playing or if I'm reading anything I can't have anything uh, playing or I just have to be able to concentrate on that. But I digress. So that's what's out of my hands. It seems like, oh, the yarn. Uh, w one thing I did is um, when I knit it again, I believe I knit the size 42. And it fit me, like I said, just fine before blocking. So I don't know if I will knit the smaller size and block it. I also saw either on a blog or on a podcast, someone had highly recommended steam blocking. I soaked this and rolled it up in a towel and laid it out. I did not stretch it. I didn't pin it anywhere except for I did pin the sleeves because I felt like they were a little tight. So I tried to stretch those out a little bit and the collar. But other than that, I just laid it out flat. But of course, it grew when I pulled it out the water. So... I'm not sure if I'm going to knit a smaller size or if I'm going to knit this size and just steam block it. If you have any suggestions, let me know. I would say I have a big gauge swatch here, but I did throw this in the dryer to get it to fit a little bit better. So it has felted some. So I don't, I did not take the time to measure my block, block gauge. And so it is, I don't know if you can see. It's felted just a little bit. Um, the yarn, the yarn is not bad, but it is pilling. I mean, I only have washed it when I blocked it, and I've worn it. Maybe this is my third time wearing it, and the yarn is pilling. So I really don't like that about the yarn. Um, it seemed like there was something else. I was Oh, the memory of the yarn. I don't know. Um, see where this is baggy here? The yarn, when I take it off, I can see my elbow print in it. Is that just um, how wool is? Or I don't know. I really don't like that about it because then when I put it back on, if my elbow is not exactly where it was the last time I took it off, then I have this this right here and when I first put it on it fit me fine but then when I took it off and I put it back on again you know I have this looseness here so I really did not like that about um, the yarn but you may see this uh, sweater again real real soon and I know I said never but never say never I said I would never um, test again it just wasn't for me but she does have another test coming up 
The reason why I tested this is because I really liked how the pattern looked, and I really enjoyed Juliana's podcast, Equal Opportunity Crafter, and you can find that at equalopportunitycrafter.blogspot.com, I believe. And so anyway, she's released another pattern, and um, I'm thinking about maybe testing that. It's the cardigan, and we'll see. It was kind of fun, and I enjoyed you know, helping her out. And I know if I don't do it, somebody else will anyway. But um, talk me down because <laughs> you know how I feel about obligation knitting. So we'll go into what's in my hand. What's in my hands first is, well, first I want to say I frogged the calligraphy. I was knitting the calligraphy cardigan by Hannah Fedick, and I was knitting it out of knit picks. Excuse me. Oh, sorry, the camera. I hit the camera. Knit Picks City Tweed DK, and it is a super fine alpaca Don Donegal tweed blend. It's a 55% merino merino wool, 25% alpaca, and 20% tweed. And I was knitting it. It's the Larkspur colorway. I frothed it. I had gotten, it was a top-down pattern, and it had like um, a four inches of ribbing again for a collar. So I had done the four inches of ribbing for the collar and had done all the increases and had already put my holders on for my sleeves and was about two inches below my sleeves. And I just wasn't, I just wasn't feeling it. I was not enjoying it. I had cast this on in August. And I just wasn't enjoying it. I think the curling back on 200 plus stitches, excuse me, 200 plus stitches just, I don't know. I just, I wasn't in the mood. And I thought, if I haven't been in the mood for this since August, you know how sometimes, you know, I've seen different ones who have been knitting it. Kagi from the High Fiber Diet podcast had mentioned it, and also I haven't watched the latest Knit Girls, um, but I know that you don't call me less. She was knitting it too, and you have to put it away for a minute sometimes when you have 200 plus stitches back and forth, you know, curling and knitting back and forth. But I hadn't been feeling it since August, so I went ahead and frothed it. I love the pattern. Another thing I was dreading was. Um, it's a a cardigan, and it has like uh, two large ribbed button bands. And I just just the thought of picking up all of those stitches for the button band. I don't know. I just wasn't wasn't for it. So I frogged it, and that was okay. And I went ahead and uh, decided to do another Hannah Fedic uh, Hannah Fedic pattern because she is one of my favorites. Um, designer, and I'm going to do, since I love this pullover so much, her Bayside pullover. And this is the Bayside pullover. And uh, it's found in the Coastal Knit, Knit book. You can also download it. I believe you can download it on Ravelry as an individual pattern, but I'm not sure, so I don't want to say that. But it's found in the Coastal Knits book that she did with Alana Dacos. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and do that. I thought that, yes, it is stockinette, which, you know, really appealed to me, just back and forth knitting. But to break that up a little bit, it has two um, sets of cables coming uh, down this way. sets of cables, the cable detail, I'm sorry, okay, the cable detail down the side. So um, I'm looking forward to doing that. So I, I did swatch with the City Tweed, and I did wash my swatch, and um, this is as good as it gets for me for a swatch. Um, but I washed my swatch, and I got the gauge that uh, I believe I needed to get. And so I cast on, and I cast on, and I knit, and I ripped, and I cast on some more. And I have probably cast this on and ripped it out 
after knitting a couple of inches probably at least four times. But I wanted to get it right. I had probably spent six hours on it um, just to get it right. And I finally, because what, what was going on with the pattern, let me show you my progress so far. And I have on my Ravelry page when I started this, I want to say it was like um, the 29th of January. I'm not sure. But this is my progress so far, um, which is not very far. I've just gotten below, oh, I'm sorry, it's upside down. And here is, you know, one of the cables that I wanted to see. So I've just gotten probably about, it seems like no more than 12 rows, maybe a little bit more. The cable repeat is over 12 rows and I think I have two twists. So let me tell you what was going on. I could not understand the directions. The directions were simple, but first you start knitting it flat without, I don't want to give a lot away, but you knit it flat and then you, for a certain amount of rows, and then you join it and knit it in the round. And for the flat, just for the flat knitting, you have your markers for your two sets of cables, and then you have your markers for your raglan increases. And so the way that the directions were written, knit and, and, and make one increase, make one left, make one right, and then do your cable. I don't know. It just was not clicking for me at all. And so I didn't think I was getting my make one left and my make one right, right, correct. And looking on other pattern pages, I saw too where others had done a, um, the, you're supposed to do the make one left and make one right, right before the marker. But that was making a little hole. And again, I hope I'm not giving too much away. This has been on others' project pages. And that was making a little hole, and I didn't like that. So I did that one, um, one stitch in like other knitters had done. And I still got the holes. And you can't see it here. But if you look in the book, or maybe if you look on Ravelry, I don't know if you can see it at the top. But on the model, you can see little bitty holes where her raglan increases are. Now, this, this sample was knit out of a linen um, yarn. So that may have been the reason. I don't know. I knitted a few times with the, trying to get my make one left and make one right correct because it seemed like they would go a little different once I started going in around. I don't know. I just could not make them. I just, in my mind, could not get it together. And I just couldn't. Uh, I, the holes were there, and I just didn't like it. So after time number five, I cast, or four, I cast on again, and I just decided to do the knit front and back. So that's what I'm doing. I'm not finding any holes at my increases. It won't be such, they're not leaning increases, but I still think it'll look fine. And so I'm enjoying it now. And now that I've gotten through the rough part and I'm just knitting, um, doing mostly basic knitting, um, I'm good to go. So that is the Bayside Pullover by Hannah Fedick. I also worked on a little bit uh, at work, and I have not picked this up since I cast it on. I think I talked to you about it last podcast. I cast on the Wave of Cow, and this pattern was gifted to me on Ravelry, and I did give the name of the person who did gift it to me, and I don't remember her name now. I want to say, um, well, I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to give credit to the wrong person. So, uh, let me see if I can get the Wave of Cocal for you. That's the Wave of Cocal and Hat. And the pattern is by Diletta 
Dilatanit or Amanda Bell. I'm sorry. Amanda Bell is who the pattern is by. And um, I'm knitting this for the, here's another picture without giving too much away. I'm knitting this for the Equal Opportunity Crafter podcast groups, um, Eyes to Eyes Knit Along, where you're supposed to knit something to keep you warm, either around your neck or on your head. Also, I'm knitting this, this Bayside Pullover on um, the Positively Knitting podcast has a year-long or 11-month-long Hannah Fetic, uh knit-along. So I will be entering this into that knit-along. And so um, I'm knitting this out of Knit Picks Kadena in the Cole colorway, and I'm really liking the stitch definition and everything on here. So this is – last time I think I had only cast on. Uh, I don't know if I had the ribbing, but this is how far I am. I am all through one repeat, and I will tell you, it took me an hour to do three rows. Again, this should be titled, My Knitting Has Attacked Me, because my knitting really has attacked me. Uh, maybe I'll title it, uh, Knitting Attacks the Lazy Podcaster. <laughs> but... Um, Again, the pattern, I just was not getting it. And without giving a lot of the pattern away, or any of the pattern away, there was a portion in the pattern where you're supposed to slip two stitches and then drop the next stitch in front, slip two stitches to the right-hand needle, drop the next stitch in front, slip those stitches back to the left-hand needle, knit that dropped stitch, and then knit those two stitches. I just was not clicking with me. I understood it, but having that one stitch just dangling there in the front wasn't doing good for me. It would keep coming unraveled and different things, and I was getting just not enjoying it. So what I figured, and I don't know if that's right, this is right or not, but what I decided to do was to slip those two stitches and hold them in the back and then knit that stitch that's supposed to be dropped in the front, and then knit those two stitches off of the cable needle. And it looks like the same thing for what um, what I had previously told you, because I did that a few times, and it just wasn't feeling good. But it took a lunch hour for me to figure that out, and now I think I'm good to go. Um, it was a, still a little fiddly because I was uh, trying to use my – 40 inch size 11 needles at work because I didn't have a cable needle with me. So I was trying to use a crochet hook just to hold them and that wasn't working. And then I tried to use this because I'm knitting it on size. I'm sorry, I guess I should have told you. I'm knitting it on US size 10 needles. And, uh, This is where I am. And I tried to use my U.S. because the, the pattern cost for U.S. 10 and U.S. 11 needles. So I was trying to use, I won't take them off the bag, it took me a while to get them in the bag. I was trying to use my 40-inch U.S. 11 needles as a cable needle and trying to slide stitches from one end to another on 40 inches wasn't fun. I have enjoyed my knitting this re week. Really, I have. I've enjoyed the challenge. It has been a little frustrating, and I don't want to say that I didn't enjoy it, but that's what happened with that. So now that's what else is on my needles, and I have one more thing to show you on my needles. Um, remember my socks and my whole ladder thing that I talked about last podcast, and it's if you didn't watch last podcast, if you're a new uh, viewer, I'll just briefly say that last podcast I talked about my knitting attacking me and how I always get ladders knitting in the round when I'm using sock weight yarn, basically, because I don't usually get it any other time. And so I showed a couple of pairs of finished socks that have ladders in them, even after they were washed. And so I had my... 
um, hot, I had a pair of stockinette socks that I was loving. It was my first time knitting self-striping socks. And I was, I am using Hiawassee Creek or Hiawassee Dye Works Creek or Hiawassee Creek Dye Works yarn and the Willy Wonka colorway and it is a purple and brown colorway and I really, really like it. And, um, so I had gotten down as far as my afterthought heel and was just getting ready to get to the toe decreases. But when I showed you, I had probably another couple of inches before the toe decreases. But I was almost there and, yep, I ripped it. Last night I decided, I think I talked about last time too, I found out a way that I do not get ladders. And the way that I do not get ladders is by knitting on two serfs. A lot of you posted in the group, or a few of you posted in the group, about knitting with double-pointed needles. And um, I do I do like to knit with double-pointed needles. I just don't like to drop them and lose them. So this is the next best, best thing to double-pointed needles. I don't get ladders for this. So I ripped it all the way back because I had ladders going up until I started on I'm sorry, on two cirques, until I started on two cirques. So I rip back up to the ribbing. There is a little bit of laddering in the ribbing, but I think I can live with that. And since I, I told myself, since you enjoyed knitting them so much the first time, then you'll enjoy knitting them again. They don't get a lot of attention because they're in my purse and because I was really concentrating on the Somiar because it was an obligation knit. And so um, I think I will be giving them more attention because when I don't really want to pay attention to increases, because already on that base side pullover, there's a round of increases and a round of playing. Already I've had to knit back because I'm doing something with the children, watching a podcast or something, and I'm just knitting, 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 knitting in a round, and I'm supposed to be either increasing or it's supposed to be a playing round. So, and I... I'm confident that I can I can do this. I'm not too my attention I'm not too ADD not to get it. But so this is where I'm at, and I ripped that out yesterday or last night, and I am looking forward to knitting them again, and I'm looking forward to really enjoying them when they're done because they won't have ladders. I love my opal socks. I showed you those opal socks, even though they're a little baggy. But this gauge is different. I really, really love the opal socks. I just am disappointed about the ladders. So, and I really hardly ever think about the ladders, but I just wanted to get it right. I mean, why knit after knitting this and not enjoying it? And I, this was a big learning experience. It boosted my confidence in my knitting. And everything, I just learned so much from doing this, but I'm not going to be able to wear it. And when I was knitting it back and forth, I kept thinking, I know, I, my flat knitting looks a lot looser than the body. And then I thought, well, that's okay. I'm bigger on, a little bigger on top than I am down here. No, that, that wasn't okay. So I'm very disappointed and to, I spent too much time on this not to get it um, where I like it. Uh, so, you know, I knit for the productivity of it, and I knit, I do enjoy the product, but I do love the process of the knitting. But once I am done, I would like to enjoy my product, and um, sometimes that's not always the case. So, next, I think would be aspirations. What I'm aspiring to or what do I want to knit next? The more I think about it as I talk to you, I don't think I'll do the test knit only because it's obligation knitting and I feel really, really crushed and pressed with obligation knitting. She did say this time that she wanted at least a body and one sleeve done, but I have to tell myself no. So. That was up in my queue, but I'm thinking of not doing it now. Um, I am going to do a baby dress. 
And I talked to you last time and Ravelry was moving slow and I did not have the pictures. And um, let me find the pictures for you here. So I'm gonna pause right here and we'll talk about the good event. Okay, so I went to a baby shower and I had gifted the new mom. Her baby is two months old, I think. A beautiful baby and I give to her a, a store-bought baby dress um, and a pair of tights and then I had folded up in the bottom of the bag I had it just folded up the papers folded up and I had IOU on this and I had two patterns and one of them was this which is called the Strimina Strima Strima and it is found on yarn, yarnmadness.com. And it is also, you can find it um, on Ravelry. And it's a free pattern. So I had a picture of that. And I also had a picture of, let me find this. I don't know how podcasters do it. I try to avoid doing this for you all. I had a picture of this which is called the little sister's dress and these were the two and this one is by Tora Froset Tora Froset and so I told her to pick one of these and that I would knit it for her and I really liked the strima and she picked this so this is fine um this is knit it can be knit out of sport or fingering weight she wanted the color that's here on the pattern I saw a beautiful color out of a fingering weight from um, Quince and Company that I want to get for her for this. So I want to have this done by the end of February. Um, and that is the strime, or this is the little sister dress. So I think it'll be a fun knit. It'll be something mindless and something easy. And she was worried about um, it being too hot because it was knit, uh, knit out of yarn, you know, dress. But I think when she sees it, she asked me even if I could make it out of cotton. And I think I'm. I think what I found was the fingering weight. I think the fingering weight will work just fine for it. And it'll really be. I told her like a shell or a jumper that she can put over a blouse or something. So that. My aspirations, that's what I'm aspiring to. I hope to make that Quinson Company purchase real soon. I have some other yarn I want to get to the Piper's Journey, which I have been aspiring to for about a year. And it's still top of my queue, at least the queue in my mind, of something I want to get started on. I had considered knitting the Daybreak. That's kind of a mindless knit that I've been wanting to knit. Uh, but I just have so much right now, so many things going on that I don't know if I'll do that yet. So that's as far as aspirations. And we'll talk a little bit now about goodie bag. I want to say I did an order from Knit Pick. And the reason why I did not order any yarn, believe it or not, I did not order any yarn. What I did order was stitch markers. One thing, one part of the frustration with the base size pullover, and I don't, I think it's just me. I don't know if it's just me, but the dangly stitch markers are beautiful, but they get in my way. I have a whole bunch of stitch markers. I don't know if you can see that. Cupcake stitch markers. And I can't believe, I, I can't believe, I can't remember where I got these cupcake stitch markers, but I love them. I have some stitch markers that have a tea set where you have a piece of cake and a spoon and a teacup and all that. I have stitch markers with Araya's name on them and Araya's picture on them. But the dangly stitch markers, when I'm, they're okay when I'm knitting in the round because I can keep them dangling to the front. And if I'm knitting, then I can just, they don't really bother me. But when you're going back and forth and wrapping around the yarn around, you always have to flip them back and forth. And sometimes if you don't flip them, your yarn gets tangled up in there. I don't know if that happens to anybody else, but it happened to me. 
I got so frustrated with that that I went and I put in an order to nitpicks and I got some of my favorite. Well, first of all, I love the jumbo locking stitch markers. And you can get these from Joanne, but they're pretty ch cheap from nitpicks. So I, I ordered those. Um, I have not used these type of stitch, mark stitch markers before, but you can easily move these around. I really got them for marking rows and decreases because of, you can slip them in and out of the stitch so I got those but just plain stitch markers and I was looking on Etsy I didn't look too much because I love the Etsy dealers and if I can find just plain stitch markers like this with a little jewel on it I had some and I don't know what happened to them then I would use those so that's what I want to use um, I got some of those and I got some of just the brass plain. These are my favorites because the other ones are pretty, but, you know, the yarn gets tangled around them. I also ordered from Knit Picks um, some, I haven't used these in a long time, uh, stoppers. Just because I've learned, first of all, it takes too much time to put your knitting, to put them on and put your knitting down. And I've just learned how to manipulate my stitches that if I am putting my knitting away, they don't really come off. But one thing I got it for is I tried on the Somiar a couple of times with the Try It On Tubing. I think I mentioned that to you before in, in a few episodes back, and I really, really liked it. But I did need a stopper on the end of the needle part. So I got a stopper, and I will use them somewhat. I also got a uh, knit picker. And after I saw this, I thought, well, I could have got that at Joann's, but that's fine. And this kind of, if you have a stitch that's pulled out or something, I believe there's a way that you can pull it back through on the wrong side. And it, it's not just for knitting. It's for store-bought garments or snags or anything on finished items. So I got that, and I also got uh, the pill shaver. I had this years, one of these years ago, I think when I was a teenager, for pills on clothes. Um, and so after I saw how this was pilling, I decided to get it. I think um, I haven't taken the time. I used it a little bit right before I started recording, but I'll have to take the time to see how that comes out. And that is my goodie bag. Um, Next, we will talk about um, our ASL Minute. And I did get some feedback that you all would continue, would like to continue to, um, for me to continue maybe with one or two ASL signs or, um, during the podcast. And I had mentioned that I had run out of really beginning conversation that I think you would have if you met a deaf or hard of hearing person at a knitting event. And someone said, well, maybe show you how to sign yarn weights and different things like that. Um, and I can do that. Um, so I will be gathering some, I will be gathering some vocabulary and just go ahead and have a list ready for the ASL Minute. I cannot think of um, anything to show you right now, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is how to sign deaf. There is actually an actually a sign for deaf. And since you're going to be signing so well once you learn sign language, some a deaf person may not know whether you're deaf or hard of hearing. So they may ask, are you deaf? And to sign deaf, you would touch your ear and your mouth. This is deaf, ear and mouth. Are you deaf? And you would say, no, I'm hearing. And this is just kind of like speaking or words are coming out of your mouth. And so you would kind of curl your finger in front of your mouth and say, hearing. This is hearing, which means you're hearing. Deaf, this comes from your ears and mouth being closed. Or way back in the day, deaf mute. A lot of Deaf people can speak now, but that's kind of how you remember it. Ears and mouth. Are you deaf or are you hearing? So that's our ASL minute. And as far as our weight loss tip, 
um, my husband and I started on February 1st. I don't know how long this podcast is going. Um, it doesn't seem like I'm taking too much of your time. I said I was going to tell you a little bit uh, more about my cousin, Selena, that was diagnosed with lung cancer in early September, and she was given until the end of December to live. And she is still living now with no signs of the lung cancer. She did seek the Lord for his healing, and she was anointed and prayed for, and her faith has carried her through that way. And after she asked God to do his part, she did her part and started a journey to wellness. And what she did was she started changing her diet. And she started she started out on a cleanse, and she is doing a vegetarian diet, and um, she went to a wellness center and spent 10 days there where they helped her with cleanses and learning how to juice right. Basically, she's been juicing and eating whole foods, and she says she's gone because the cancer was in her lungs and in her esophagus, and she has gone from cancer to coughing up blood and pain and headaches and everything else to no sign of the cancer at all. She was in uh, stage two, but they thought that she was going to rapidly advance to stage four by then. She has not gone back for another screening because she says she's not ready to subject her body to that radiation yet, but she can feel that she has no cancer. Uh, if you want inf more information on the the wellness center that she went to in Tennessee is White Creek Wellness Center, and you can find that online. Or if you want to follow her blog where she blogs about her experience there and her healing, I can give you that information. But what she has started doing, and I wish I had brought it, as a survivor, she has put together a booklet to help her friends um, take a journey of wellness if they want. Not necessarily if you have cancer or anything, but just of eating better and taking care of our bodies better. So we are doing a cleanse. There's a juice fast that Selena did for 10 days where she did not eat and that she only had juiced whole foods, whole vegetables. Um, and she used a juicer. And there's a lot of information on that. And I've been thinking about maybe sharing it little by little on the podcast, the benefits of juicing and, and different things like that. So she did that cleanse for 10 days. Because of her cancer condition, they did not want her to go totally cleansing with, I mean, totally on juice without eating too. So she is eating, but she still juices a lot. Um, and you can do the fast anywhere from however long you want. Um, I know of a woman who is almost, She's got about eight more days, and she she de she determined to do it for 60 days. She's um, Selena's daughter, actually, and she's 25 years old, and she decided to do the fast for 60 days. She's on she's got about eight more days to go, and she's lost 50 pounds. And she she did need to lose it, and she's very happy, and she feels great. So Clyde and I set a goal for all of that. And this is supposed to be a minute set a goal for the month of February that we were going to do the juice fast cleanse. So that is what we're doing. We're not taking in any solid food. We are just juicing and um, drinking water. Um, and there is a regimen that you go through. And maybe I'll share more of what I'm juicing if you're interested in what I have every day. Um, this is day six for me. I have not weighed in yet. I am doing this not only to cleanse my body. First of all, I feel great. I did not believe. I told Selena I thought I would be weak and dizzy and different things like that. I feel great. I cannot believe I feel so good without caffeine. It's been six days since I've had caffeine, and I feel great. Um, I really don't get hungry. You're either taking in juice or water every hour, so I really don't get hungry, but I want to eat. And, um, but I'm doing this not only for physical, yes, I do want to lose weight, but I need to take control back. And I think I've talked about that uh, before. 
for me personally, and I'm not talking about anybody else, but my eating has gotten out of control. I feel like uh, there's a verse in the Bible where it talks about their God is their belly. And I feel like I had made my belly or my appetite my God. Whatever my appetite wanted, that's what I would feed it. I would, and I just felt like, I was losing control. My my cravings were in charge. My stomach was in charge. And um, I didn't have any control. So this 28 days is not just so I can lose a lot of weight. I would like to lose weight. But it's so that I can have control. I can take control back. I can uh, learn to discipline. Again, I talked about before, discipline myself and discipline my eating habits, and then that will carry over into other areas of my life, areas um, spiritually, and just different different everyday things. So that's where I am. That's my weight loss tip, um, I guess you would say, or that's where I am on my weight loss journey. Um, it is not easy. My stomach is not wanting to be dethroned, and my appetites are not going down without a fight. I do want to eat, but it's not because I'm hungry. It's just because it sounds good or it looks good. So um, wish me the best there. And I think we have come to the end of our row, as the knitting girls, knit girls would say. I do want to discuss a little bit with you in our knitting circle. It was something I wanted to talk to you about before, and um, I didn't get a chance to talk about it. So let me pull out my knitting. I guess I could have been knitting all this time since we've been talking. And for our, our knitting circle, and I thought about this um, back in December. You know, I work in retail. And it has been frigid cold in Ohio. It has been 100, or, I'm sorry, zero and below. And um, I have refused to buy a scarf or gloves. My husband bought me some fingerless gloves that uh, the, you can pull the tops of them back. Um, and I was a little offended by that. And, the, and, and let me ask you this. The reason why I um, did not want to buy a scarf or gloves is because I know I can make them. And I feel like I almost feel like I'm betraying my knitting or why should I look at the different things in the, in the store and they're really cheap or, you know, you can get an, um, a, a cheap, even a fleece scarf or, or whatever. But I just think, why would I even spend $5 or $10 for that when I know I can make it? Now, I know I really don't have the time to make it, but I know I can make it. And there's just something about the fact that I know I can make it that makes me not want to buy it. And it's the same with sweaters. I have lots of store-bought sweaters. Um, I love sweaters. I love sweaters. I love bags. And I love baskets. But I, I know I can make sweaters. So now I see beautiful sweaters at the store, and I feel guilty about buying them or wanting to buy them. And I won't buy them. I say, why should I buy that? And I know that I can make it. And so I kind of think that, you know, I'm a little off in my thinking. It really, but I just wonder, I, I asked another one of my knitting friends, do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like, you know, even with, I don't feel so guilty about my children. I And the reason why is because they lose things so much. So um, buying them hats you know, a dozen at a time or buying them gloves because they lose them when they go out to play and they lose them in school and different things like that. I don't feel so bad about that. But I don't know. There's just this, I don't, I wouldn't say it's a guilty feeling, but it's just a feeling like, and I, you know, it could be a little bit of pride too, because if I'm wearing a store-bought sweater, the first thing people ask me is, did you make that? It's like they expect it from me. They expect to know, which, like I said, I've never knit an adult sweater before, but they see me knitting all the time, so, before this one. And so, I don't know. It's just, I don't want to buy anything that I know I can make. 
And so I've been freezing this winter. It doesn't make any sense. I have finally started using my hitchhiker outside instead of wearing it as a, you know, I used to wear it as an accessory, but now I, I kind of wear it with my coat. And I thought, well, that's a way, you know, that I can do more of the small shawls and I can kind of wear those, you know, next winter. And I'm looking forward to having this cowl and it probably will not be finished before the winter's out. I'm not sure. I would like to get this face side pullover done by the end of February. I think March, it's, it is alpaca, so it will be warm. But I think March, um, it'll still be cool enough that I should be able to get wear out of it. When I first took this off the needle, I told my husband I would never take it off. But then, you know, after I washed it and blocked it and was so unhappy with it, um, I, you know, just kind of put it in the closet for a timeout. So I do look forward to having that pullover, and that means changing my wardrobe a little bit because I usually wear one-piece dresses just because I'm more comfortable with that, and that's what I prefer. But I decided, you know, pullovers are fun to make. What's wrong with matching my wardrobe with what I'm knitting? So I will just make adjustments in my wardrobe and get some nice skirts and things. and where was my pullover so that's where i am on my knitting circle so we already have a share question but under uh this episode's um topic in the ravelry group or you can pm me or you can uh email me at knittingmother at gmail.com if you want to just share how you feel about buying hats and gloves and scarves and sweaters when you know you can knit them is there a guilty feeling at all? Am I just kind of weird or, you know, I just kind of, you know, that's been on my mind for a while and I wanted to share that with you. So thank you so much for spending time with me. Um, I hope I haven't talked your ears off too much. I hope that this, you know, kind of lazy format isn't too out of the woods for you or whatever. And I will talk with you soon. Take care. I feel I should just slam it down on the table and walk away madly Cause my stitches don't count up and I missed a cable this yarn